Thanks for being here. The season is definitely upon us, is it not? Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. <laughs> is there any finer season than this one, Rick? Or anyone else? Well, I don't think so. So, and at the moment, I've got the microphone. Cool. Well, anyway. Um... Welcome to our Friday the 13th special presentation of Stephen King's 1408. It's Friday and you guys are still showing up. That, you know, that really warms my little pea picking heart. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Um, 1408. Spend the night with us in New York City's most haunted hotel room. Listener discretion is advised. I mean, it's Stephen King, y'all. All profanity has been removed from our presentation tonight. Hence my long afternoon. Um, and there's no weird sex or anything like that. But there are several um, ghosts that got to be ghosts because they killed themselves. So that's what I got. And it's Stephen King. <coughs> Tonight is the dark of the moon. No, really. A new moon and tomorrow is a total solar eclipse. And it's Friday the 13th in October. Ooh. <laughs> That's why we couldn't possibly miss telling a story tonight. Storytelling Countdown to Halloween continues on the Storylink Radio YouTube channel. 31 Days to Halloween and 31 Stories. A new one every night at midnight. You can catch it right there. And if you missed all the ones coming up to now, you can still catch them. Plus 2021 Countdown and 2022 Countdown. All right there at that same link. Anyway, here we go. 1408. Mike Enslin was still in the revolving door when he saw Olin the manager of the Hotel Mahana, sitting in one of the overstuffed lobby chairs. Mike's heart sank. Eh, maybe I should have brought the lawyer again after all, he thought. Well, too late now. And even if Olin had decided to throw up another roadblock or two between Mike and room 1408, that wasn't all bad. Eh, there were compensations. Olin was crossing the room with one pudgy hand held out as Mike left the revolving door. <coughs> the Mahana was on 61st Street, around the corner from 5th Avenue. Small, but smart hotel. A man and a woman dressed in evening clothes passed Mike as he reached for Olin's hand, switching his small overnight case to his left hand in order to do it. The woman was blonde, dressed in black, of course, and the light, flowery smell of her perfume seemed to summarize New York. On the mezzanine level, someone was playing night and day in the bar as if to underline the summary. <clears throat> Mr. Enslin, good evening. Mr. Olin, is there a problem? Olin looked pained. For a moment, he glanced around the small, smart lobby as if for help. At the concierge's stand, a man was discussing theater tickets with his wife, while the concierge himself watched them with a small, patient smile. At the front desk, a man with a rumpled look one only got after long hours in business class, was discussing his reservation with a woman in a smart black suit that could have itself had doubled for evening wear. Yeah, it was business as usual at the Hotel Mahana. There was help for everyone except poor Mr. Olin, who had fallen into the writer's clutches. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Olin, is there a problem? Wrong. Sorry, lost something there. There we go. Mr. Olin, Mike repeated. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Mr. Enslin, I, could I speak to you for a moment in my office? Well, why not? It would help the section on room 1408 add to the ominous tone the readers of his book seemed to crave, and that wasn't all. Mike Enslin hadn't been sure until now, in spite of all the backing and filling, and now he was. Olin was really afraid of room 1408. Manager of the hotel, and he's afraid of a room they're in. And he was afraid of what might happen to Mike there tonight. Well, of course, Mr. Olin. Olin, the good host, reached for Mike's bag. Well, allow me. No, nah, I'm fine with it, Mike said. Nothing but a change of clothes and a toothbrush. Are you sure? Yes, Mike said. I'm sure. I'm already wearing my lucky Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> it's the one with the ghost repellent. Olin did not smile back. He sighed instead. A little round man in a dark cutaway coat and a near neatly knotted tie. Mm. Very good, Mr. Enslin. Follow me. The hotel manager had seemed 
tentative in the lobby, almost beaten. In his oak-paneled office with the pictures of the hotel on the walls, the Mahana had opened in 1910. Mike might publish without the benefit of reviews and journals of the big city papers, but he did his research. Olin seemed to gain assurance again. There was a Persian carpet on the floor. Two standing lamps cast a mild yellow light. A desk lamp with a green lozenge-shaped shade stood in the desk next to a humidor. And next to the humidor were Mike Ensland's last three books. Paperback editions, of course. There had been no hardbacks. Main host has been doing a little research of his own, Mike thought to himself. Mike sat down in front of the desk. He expected Olin to sit behind the desk, but Olin surprised him. He took the chair beside Mike's, crossed his legs, then leaned forward over his tidy little belly to touch the humidor. Cigar, Mr. Enslin? No, thank you. I don't smoke. Olin's eyes shifted to the cigarette behind Mike's right ear. Parked in a jaunty, just the, ju just the way uh, an old-time wisecracking reporter might have parked his next smoke below the press tag stuck in the band of his fedora. The cigarette behind Mike's ear had become so much a part of him that for a moment Mike honestly didn't know what Olin was looking at. And then he laughed, took it down, looked at it himself, and looked back at Olin. <laughs> now, man, I haven't had a smoke in nine years. I had an older brother who died of lung cancer. I quit after he died. The cigarette behind the ear? Yeah. <laughs> Eh, it's part of affectation, I guess, part superstition. I, like the Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> with the cigarettes, uh, you sometimes see on people's desks or walls mounted in a little box with a sign saying, break glass in case of emergency. Hey, is, is 1408 a smoking room, by the way, Mr. Olin? Just in case a uh, nuclear war breaks out? Mm, yes, as a matter of fact, it is, Mr. Enslin. Well, <laughs> that's one less worry in the watches of the night. Uh Mr. Olin sighed again, but this sigh did not have the disconsolate quality of his lobby sigh. Yes, it was the office, Mike reckoned. Olin's office, his his special little place. Even this afternoon, when Mike had come when Mike had come accompanied by Roberts and the lawyer, Olin had seemed less flustered once they were in here. Why not? Where else could you feel in charge if not in your special place? Olin's office was a room with good pictures on the walls, a good rug on the floor and good cigars in the humidor. A lot of managers had no doubt conducted a lot of business in here since 1910. In its own way, it was as New York as the blonde in her black off-the-shoulder dress, her smell of perfume and her unarticulated promises in the small hours of the morning. You uh, still don't think I can talk you out of this idea of yours, do you? Olin asked. I know you can't, Mike said, replacing the cigarette behind his ear. He didn't slick his hair back with a, well, come on in. He didn't slick his hair back with Vitalis or Wild Root cream oil, as those colorful fedora-wearing scribblers of yore had. But he still changed the cigarette every day, just as he changed his underwear. You sweat back there behind your ears. If you examine the cigarette at the end of the day before throwing its unsmoked deadly length into the toilet, Mike could see the faint yellow-orange residue of the sweat on the thin white paper. It did not increase the temptation to light up. How he had smoked for almost 20 years, 30 butts a day, sometimes 40 was now beyond him. Why he had done it was an even better question. Olin picked up the little stack of paperbacks from the blotter. <clears throat> well, I sincerely hope you're wrong, Mr. Enslin. I'm certainly going to try. Mike ran open the zipper on the side of the pocket of his overnight bag. He brought out a Sony mini quarter. Would you mind if I taped our conversation, Mr. Owen? Olin waved a hand. Mike pushed record and the little red light came on. The reels began to turn. I don't trust those digital hoosets, you know. I like the feel, the, the sound of the cassette spooling along. Olin, meanwhile, was shuffling slowly through the stack of books, reading the titles, and as always, when he saw his books in someone else's hands, Mike Inslin felt <clears throat> the oddest mix of um, emotions, uh, pride, unease, amusement, defiance. <laughs> And even a touch of shame somehow. He had no business feeling ashamed of his books. They kept him nicely over the last five years, and he didn't have to share any of the profits with a packager. Book horrors was what this agent called them, perhaps partly in envy, because he had come up with this concept himself. Although after the first book had sold so well, only a moron could have missed the concept. What was there to do after Frankenstein but <laughs> bride of Frankenstein? Still, Mike had gone to Iowa. 
He had studied with Jane Smiley. He had once been on a panel with Stanley Elkin. He had once aspired to absolutely no one in his current circle of friends and acquaintances had any least inkling of this, to be published as a Yale younger poet. And when the hotel manager began speaking the titles aloud, Mike found himself wishing he had not challenged Olin with the recorder. Later, he would listen to Olin's measured tones and imagine he heard contempt in them. Mike touched a cigarette behind his ear without being aware of it. Uh, ten nights in ten haunted houses, Olin read. Ten nights in ten haunted graveyards. Ten nights in ten haunted castles. Mm, three appealing books, hmm? He looked up at Mike with a faint smile on the corners of his mouth. You got to Scotland on that last one, huh? Not to mention the Vienna woods. All tax deductible, correct? Hauntings are, after all, your business. Do you have a point? <laughs> You're sensitive about these, aren't you? Olin asked him. Sensitive? Yes. Vulnerable? No. If you're hoping to persuade me out of your hotel by critiquing my books... No. 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 Uh, not at all, Mr. Enslin. I, I was curious, that's all. I sent Marcel, he's the concierge, on, on days, out to get them two days ago when you first appeared with your request. <laughs> Let's be honest, it was a demand, not a request. It still is. You heard, Mr. Roberts, and my lawyer... New York state law, not to mention two federal civil rights laws, forbid you to deny me a specific room. If I request that specific room and the room is vacant, and 1408 is vacant. Room 1408 is always vacant these days. But Mr. Olin was not to be diverted from the subject of Mike's last three books. <clears throat> New York Times bestsellers, all oh, just yet. Hmm. He simply shuffled through them a third time. The mellow lamplight reflected off their shiny covers. There was a lot of purple on the covers. Purple old scary purple sold scary books better than any other color, Mike had been told. Ah, uh, yeah. I didn't get a chance to dip into these until early this evening, Olin said. I've been quite busy. I usually am. The Mahana is a small by New York standard, yes, but we run at ninety percent occupancy, and usually a problem walks to the door with every guest. Like me. <laughs> Uh, I'd say you're a bit of a special problem, Mr. Enslin. You and your Robertson and all your threats. Mike felt nettled all over again. He'd made no threats unless Robertson himself, being a lawyer, was a threat. And he had been forced to use that lawyer, as a man might be forced to use a crowbar in a rusty lockbox, which should no longer accept the key. Yeah, but the lockbox isn't yours, a, Mike and a voice inside Mike's head told him. But the laws of the state and the country said differently. The laws said that room 1408 in Hotel Mahana was his if he wanted it, as long as no one else wanted it first. He became aware that Olin was watching him still with a faint smile, as if he had been following Mike's interior dialogue almost word for word. It was an uncomfortable feeling, and Mike was finding this an unexpectedly uncomfortable meeting. It felt as if he had been on the defenses ever since he'd taken out the mini-quarter, which was usually intimidating, and turned it on. Pause for it momentarily, please. Hello, Thor. Hello, Stevie Ray. Ah, and Kim Star. Hi. If any of this has a point, Mr. Odin, I'm afraid I lost sight of it a turn or two back. I've had a long day. If you, if, if our wrangle over room 1408 is really over, I'd like to go upstairs and... I read one, um, <clears throat> what would you call them, essays? Tales, Mr. Enslin? Bill Payers was what Mike called the stories in his books, but he did not intend to say that with the tape running, not even though it was his tape. Story, then. Bolin decided. I read one story from each book, Mr. Enslin, the one about the Rilsby house in Kansas from your Haunted Houses book. Ah, uh, yeah, the axe murders. The fellow who had chopped up all six members of the Eugene Rilsby family had never been caught. Exactly so. And the one about the night you spent camped out on the graves of the lovers in Alaska who committed suicide, the one people keep claiming to see around Sitka, and, and the account of your night in the Gartsby Castle. <laughs> That was actually quite amusing, Mr. Enslin. I was surprised. Mike's ear was carefully tuned to catch the undernotes of contempt and even the blandest comment about his ten nights books. And he had no doubt that he sometimes heard contempt that wasn't there. 
Few creatures on the earth are so paranoid as the writer who believes deep in his heart that he is slumming, I could discover, but he didn't really believe there was any contempt there. Well, um, thank you, I guess. He glanced down at his mini quarter. Usually his little red eyes seem to be watching the other guy, daring him to say the wrong thing. This evening he seemed to be looking at Mike himself. <laughs> yes, Mr. Anson, I meant it as a compliment. Olin tapped the books. I expect to finish these. But for the writing, it's it's the writing I like. I was surprised to find myself laughing uh, at your quite unsupernatural adventures in Guards Bay Castle. And I was surprised to find you as good as you are, as subtle as you are. I expected more hack and slash, frankly. Mike steeled himself what would almost certainly come next, Olin's variation of what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this. Olin, the urbane hotelier, host of blonde women who wore black dresses out into the night, hirer of weedy retiring men who wore tuxes and tinkled old standards like night and day in the hotel bar. Olin, who probably read Proust on his nights off. But they're disturbing, too, these books. If I hadn't looked at them, I don't think I would have bothered waiting for you this evening. Once I saw that lawyer with his briefcase, I knew you meant to stay in the damned room, and I, nothing else I could say was apt to dissuade you. Uh, huh. But the books, Mr. Enslin, these books. Mike reached out and snapped off the mini quarter. That little red staring eye was starting to give him the willies. You want to know why I'm bottom feeding, is that it, <laughs> Mr. Olin? Hmm. I assume you do it for the money, Olin said mildly. And you're feeding a long way from the bottom, Mr. Ensign, at least in my estimation. Although it's interesting you should jump so nimbly to such a conclusion. Mike felt warmth rising in his cheeks. Now, this was not going the way he uh, expected at all. He had <clears throat> never snapped his recorder off in the middle of a conversation. But Olin wasn't what he seemed. I was led astray by his hands, Mike thought. Those pudgy little hotel manager hands with their neat white crescents of manicured nails. Ah, uh, what concerned me? Mr. And what frightened me is that I found myself reading the work of an intelligent, talented man who doesn't believe one single thing he's written. Well, that wasn't exactly true, Mike thought. He'd written perhaps two dozen stories he believed in. I had actually published a few. He'd written reams of poetry he believed in during his first 18 months in New York when he said starved on the payroll of the village voice. But did he believe that the headless ghost of Eugene Rilsby walked in the deserted Kansas farmhouse by moonlight? No. He had spent the night in that farmhouse. He had camped out on the dirty linoleum hills of the kitchen floor, and he had seen nothing scarier than two mice trundling over the baseboard. He had spent hot summer nights in the ruins of the Transylvanian castle where Vlad Tepes supposedly still held court. The only vampires to actually show up had been a fog of European mosquitoes. During the night, camped out by the grave of the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, a white blood-streaked figure waving a knife had come at Mike out of the two o'clock darkness. But the giggles of the apparition's friends had given him away, and Mike Enslin had, had not been terribly impressed anyway. He knew a teenage ghost waving a rubber knife when he saw one. But he had no intention of telling any of this to Olin. He couldn't afford to. Well, except he could. The mini-recorder, a mistake from the get-go he now understood, was stowed away again. This meeting was about as off the record as you could get. Also, he had come to admire Olin in a weird way. And once you admired a man, you wanted to tell him the truth. No, I don't believe in ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties. <laughs> I think it's good there are no such things, but I've kept an open mind from the very start. I may never win a Pulitzer Prize for investigating the barking ghost in Mount Hope Cemetery, but I would have written fairly about him if he'd shown up. Olin said something only a single word, but too low for Mike to make it out. I beg your pardon? I said no. Olin looked at him almost apologetically. Mike sighed. Olin thought he was a liar. When you got to that point in the conversation, the only choices were to put up your dukes or disengage totally from the discussion. Tell you what, why don't we leave this for another day, Mr. Olin? I'll just go upstairs and brush my teeth. Perhaps I'll see Kevin O'Malley materialize behind me in the bathroom mirror. Mike started to get out of his chair, and Olin put out one of his pudgy, carefully manicured hands to stop him. I'm not calling you a liar. 
But Mr. Enslin, you, you don't believe. Ghosts rarely appear to those who don't believe in them, and when they do, they are rarely seen. Why, Eugene Rilsby could have bowled his severed head all the way down the front hall of his home, and you would not have heard a thing. Mike stood up, then bent to grab his overnight case. If that's so, I won't have anything to worry about room 1408, will I? Ha <laughs> ha. Ah. But you will, Mr. Enslin, Bowling said. You will. Because there are no ghosts in room 1408 of the Hotel Mahana. There never have been. No. There's no ghost, but there's something in there. I felt it myself, Mr. Enslin. But it's not a spirit's presence. In an abandoned house or an old castle keep, you, your unbelief may serve you as protection. In room 1408, it will only render you more vulnerable. Don't do it, Mr. Enslin. That's why I waited for you tonight to ask you, to beg you not to do it. Of all the people on earth who don't belong in that room, the man who wrote these cheerful, exploitative, true ghost books leads that list. Mike heard this and didn't hear it at the same time. You turned off your tape recorder, he was raving to himself. He embarrasses me into turning off my tape recorder, and then he turns into Boris Karloff, host of the All-Star Spook Weekend. But I don't care. I'll quote him anyway. If he doesn't like it, let him sue me. All at once, Mike was burning to get upstairs, not just so that he could start getting his long weed, long night in the corner hotel room over with, but because <clears throat> he wanted to transcribe what Olin had just said while it was still fresh in his mind. Have a drink, Mr. Enslin. No, I really... Mr. Olden reached out his coat pocket and brought out a key and a long brass paddle. The brass looked old and scratched and tarnished and embossed on it were the room numbers 1408. Please, Olden said. Humor me. You give me ten more minutes of your time, long enough to consume a short scotch, and I'll hand you this key. I would give almost anything to be able to change your mind, Mr. Enslin, but I like to think I can recognize the inevitable when I see it. What, you should actually use keys here? That's sort of a nice touch. Antiki. Mm. The Mahana went to mag card system in 1979, Mr. Enslin, the year I took the job as manager. 1408 is the only room in the house that still opens with a key. There was no need to put a mag card lock on its door because there's never anyone inside. The room was last occupied by a paying guest in 1978. You're kidding me. Mike sat down again, unlimbered his mini quarter again. He pushed record button and said, House manager Olin claims 1408 not rented to a paying guest in over 20 years. It is just as well that 1408 has never needed a mag card lock on his door because I am completely positive the dice would not work. Digital wristwatches don't work in room 1408. Sometimes they run backwards, sometimes they simply go out, but you can't tell time with one. Not in room 1408, you can't. The same is true of pocket calculators and cell phones. If you're wearing a beeper, Mr. Enslin, I advise you to turn it off because once you're in room 1408, it will start beeping at will. <laughs> and turning it off isn't guaranteed to work either. It may turn itself back on. The only sure cure is to pull the batteries. Mike pushed the stop button on the mini quarter without examining the buttons. Actually, Mr. Enslin, the only sure cure is to stay out of that room. <laughs> yes, I can't do that, though, can I? said Mike, taking his mini-quarter back and stowing it once more. But I think I can take time for that drink. <clears throat> As shall I. While Olin poured from the fumed oak bar beneath an oil painting in Fifth Avenue at the turn of the century, Mike asked him how, if the room had been continuously unoccupied since 1978, how did Olin know that high-tech devices and gadgets did not work inside that room? Uh... Sorry, Miss Trenson, I did not mean to give you the impression that uh, that no one had set rooms at foot through the doors in 1978, that room. Um, for one thing, there are maids in once a month to give the place a light turn. That means Mike, who had been working in ten haunted hotel rooms for about four months at that point, said, well, I know what a light turn means, Mr. Olin. A light turn in the unoccupied room would include opening the windows to change the air, dusting, enough tidy bowl in the can to turn the water briefly blue, a change towels, probably not the bed linen, not on a light turn. He wondered if he should have brought his sleeping bag. Crossing the Persian from the bar with their drinks in his hand, Olin seemed to read Mike's thought on his face. 
The uh, sheets were changed this very afternoon, Mr. Ensler. Why don't you drop that? Call me Mike. Ah. Uh, no. No, in view of what the uh, future has in store for you, Mr. Ensler, I don't think I'd be comfortable with that. I would not be comfortable with that at all. He handed Mike his drink. Here's to you, Mr. Ensler. And you, Mike lifted his glass, meaning to clink it against Olin's, but Olin pulled his back. No, no. This toast is to you, Mr. Ensler, I insist. Tonight we should both drink to you. You will need it. Mike sighed, clinked the rim of his glass against the rim of Olin's, and said, <laughs> All right, to me, then. You have been right at home in a horror movie, Mr. Olin. You could have played the gloomy old butler who tries to warn the young married couple away from Castle Doom. You could have been the perfect ghost host. <laughs> Olin sat down. Yes, well. It's a part I have not had to play very often, thankfully. Room 1408 is not listed on any of the websites dealing with paranormal locations or psychic hotspots. Well, that'll change after my book, Mike thought, sipping his drink. And there are no ghost tours or the stops at the Hotel Bahana, although they do tour through the Sherry Netherland, the plaza, the park lane. We've kept room 1408 as quiet as possible, although, of course, the history has always been there for a researcher like you, who is both lucky and tenacious. Mike allowed himself a small smile. Veronique changed the sheets. Um, I accompanied her, said Mr. Olin. You should feel flattered, Mr. Enslin. It's almost like having your ships, your knight's linen put on by royalty. Veronique and her sister came to the Mahana as chambermaids in 1971-72. V, as we call her, is the Hotel Mahana's longest-running employee, with at least six years seniority over me. She has since risen to head housekeeper. I guess she hadn't changed a sheet in six years before today. She used to do all the turns in 1408, and she and her sister until um, about 1992. Veronique and Celeste were twins, and the bond between them seemed to make them, um, how shall I put it, uh, not immune to 1408, but, well, it's equal, perhaps, at least for the short periods of time needed to give the room a light turn. You're not going to tell me the, this Veronique sister died in the room, are you? No, 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 not at all, Olin said. She left service around here in 1988, suffering from ill health. But I don't rule out the idea that 1408 may have played a part in her worsening mental and physical condition. <sighs> we seem to have built a rapport here, Mr. O'Line. I hope I don't snap it by telling you that I find that ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, so hard-headed for a student of the airy world, aren't you, Mr. Enslin? I owe it to my readers, Mike said blandly. I suppose I could have... Simply could have left 1408 as it is anyway during most of its days and nights. Hotel manager mused. Door locked, lights off, shades drawn to keep the sun from the fading, the carpet coverlet pulled, doorknob, breakfast menu on the bed. Uh, but I, uh, I somehow I can't think to, bear to think of the air getting stuffy and old like the air in an attic. I can't bear to think of the dust piling up until it's thick and fluffy. <laughs> what does that make me, persnickety or downright obsessive? It makes you a hotel manager, Mr. Olin. Uh, I suppose so. Ah, well, in any case, V and C turned that room very quick, just in and out, until C retired and V got her first big promotion. After that, I, the other maids I do it in pairs, always picking, I always pick ones that got on well with each other, hoping for that bond to withstand the bogeys. Hmm. Hoping for the bond, yes. And you can make fun of room 1408 bogeys as much as you want, Mr. Ensler, but you'll feel them almost at once, of that I'm confident. Whatever there is in that room, it's not shy. <laughs> On many occasions, all that I could manage, I went with the maids to supervise them. He paused here, then added almost reluctantly. To, uh, uh, to pull them out, I suppose, if anything really awful started to happen. Nothing ever did. There were several who had weeping fits, one who had a laughing fit. I, you know, I don't know why someone laughing out of control should be more frightening than someone sobbing, but it is. And a number have fainted. Nothing too terrible, however. I had time enough over the years to make a few primitive experiments, uh, beepers, cell phones, and such, but nothing too terrible, thankfully. Hmm. He paused again and added in a queer, flat tone. One of them went blind. What? Yeah, she went blind. 
Uh, Rami Van Gelder, that was. She was dusting the top of the television, and all at once she began to scream. I asked her what was wrong. She dropped her dust rag and put her hands over her eyes and screamed out that she was blind, but that she could see the most awful colors. They went away almost as soon as I got her out through the door, and by the time I got her down the hallway to the elevator, her side had begun to come back. You're telling me all this just to scare me, Miss Roland, aren't you? To scare me off. Oh, no. Indeed I am not, Mr. Ensign. Indeed I am not. You know the history of the room, beginning with the suicide of its first occupant. Mike did know. Kevin O'Malley, a sewing machine salesman, had taken his life on October 13th, 1910. A leaper who had left a wife and seven children behind. By the way, October 13th, 1910 was also a Friday the 13th. Just like tonight. Really, look it up. And I suppose by now some of you realize the room number adds up to 1 plus 4 plus 0 plus 8. Mm -hmm. 14 of 8. <clears throat> anyway, five men and one woman have jumped from that room. Single window, Mr. Enslin. Three women and one man have overdosed with pills in that room. Two found in bed, two found in the bathrooms, one in the tub, and one sitting slumped on the toilet. A man hanged himself in the closet in 1940. Yeah, Henry Storkin, Mike said. That one was probably accidental, though, wasn't it? Uh, perhaps. It was also Randolph Hyde, who slid his wrists and read the newspaper while he bled to death. The point is, Mr. Enslin, that if you can't be swayed from your intention by a record of twelve suicides in sixty-eight years, I doubt if the gasps and fibrillations of a few chambermaids will stop you. Hmm. Only twelve suicides? Twelve. Hmm. Gasps and fibrillations. <laughs> That's nice, Mike thought and wondered if he could steal it for his book. Few of the pairs who have turned 1408 over the years care to go back more than a few times, Roland said, and finished his drink in a tidy little gulp. Except for the French twins. V and C. Hmm, that's true, Mr. Roland nodded. Mike didn't care much about the maids and their, what did Olin call them, their gasps and fibrillations. He did feel mildly rankled by Olin's enumeration of the suicides, as if Mike was so thick he had missed, not the fact of them, but their import. Except really there was no import. Both Abraham Lincoln and John Kennedy had vice presidents named Johnson. The names Lincoln and Kennedy had seven letters. Both Lincoln and Kennedy had been elected in years ending in 60. But all these coincidences prove yeah, not a thing. The suicides make a wonderful segment for my book, Mike said. But since the tape recorder is off, I can tell you they amount to what a statistician resource of mine calls the cluster effect. <laughs> yes, old and mused, Charles Dickens called it the potato effect. I beg your pardon? <laughs> when Jacob Marley's ghost first speaks to Scrooge, Scrooge tells him he could be nothing but a blob of mustard, a bit of underdone potato. Is that supposed to be funny? Mike asked a trifle coldly. Uh, nothing about this strikes me as funny, Mr. Enslin. Nothing at all. Listen very closely, please. V's sister Celeste died of a heart attack. At that point, she was suffering mid-age Alzheimer's, a disease which struck her very early in life. Yet her sister is fine and well, according to what you said earlier. An American success story, in fact. And you are yourself, Mr. Olin, from the look of you. Yet you've been in and out of that room 1408 how many times? A hundred? Two hundred? Oh, for very short periods of time, Olin said. It's perhaps like entering a room filled with poison gas. If one holds one's breath, one may be all right. I, I see you don't like that comparison. You no doubt find it overwrought, perhaps ridiculous. Yet I believe it's a good one, Mr. Enslin. Mike steepled his fingers beneath his chin. It's also possible that some people react more quickly, more violently to whatever lives in that room. Just as some people who go scuba diving are more prone to the bends than others... Over the Mahana's near century of operation, the hotel staff has grown ever more aware that 1408 is a poisoned room. It has become part of the house's history, Mr. Enslin. No one talks about it, just as no one mentions the fact that here, as in most hotels, the 14th floor is actually the 13th. But they know it. If all the facts and records pertaining to that room were available, they would tell an amazing story, Mr. Enslin, one more uncomfortable than your readers might enjoy. I should guess, for example, that every hotel in New York has had its suicides. But I would be willing to wager my life that only in Mahana have uh, there been a dozen of them in a single room. 
And leaving Celeste Romando aside, what about the other natural deaths in 1408, the so-called natural deaths? How many have there been? The idea of so-called natural deaths in room 1408 never occurred to Mike. Thirty, Olin replied. Thirty at least. Thirty that I know of. You're lying. The words were out of Mike's mouth before he could call them back. <sighs> no, Mr. Ensign, I assure you that I am not lying. Did you really think that we keep that room empty just out of some vapid old wife superstition or ridiculous New York tradition? That's a lot of nights for a hotel room to not get paid for. The idea may be that every fine ho hotel should have at least one unquiet spirit clanking around in a suit of invisible chains. Mike Ginson realized that such, such an idea, not articulated, but there, just the same, had indeed been hanging around his new Ten Nights book. To hear Olin scoff at it in the irritated tones of a scientist scoffing at a brouhaha-waving native did nothing to smooth his, smooth his chagrin, though. Yes, Mr. Ensign, we have our superstitions, our traditions in the hotel trade, but we don't let them get in the way of our business. There's an old saying in the Midwest where I broke into the business, there are no drafty rooms when the cattlemen are in town. If we have empties, Mr. Ensign, we fill them. The only exception to that rule I have ever made, and the only talk like this I have ever had, is on account of room 1408, a room on the 13th floor, whose very numerals add up to 13. See? Told you. Olin looked levelly at Mike Enslin. It is a room, uh, not only of suicide, but of strokes heart attacks, epileptic seizures. One man who stayed in that room, this was in 1973, apparently drowned in a bowl of soup. You would undoubtedly call that ridiculous, but I spoke to the man who was head of hotel security at that time, and he saw the death certificate. The power of whatever inhabits that room, Mr. Enslin, seems to be less around midday, which is when the room turns always occur. Yet I know of several maids who have turned that room who now suffer from heart problems, emphysema, diabetes, a host of things. There was a heating problem on that floor three years ago. Mr. Neal, the head maintenance engineer at that time, had to go into several of the rooms to check the heating units. 1408 was one of them. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Neal seemed fine then, both in the room and later on. But he died the following afternoon of a massive cerebral hemorrhage. <sighs> ah, coincidence, Mike scoffed. Yet he could not deny that Olin was good. Had the man been a camp counselor, he would have scared 90% of the kiddies back home after the first round of campfire ghost stories. Oh, wish you had had him at the scary stories camp out last night. Coincidence, <laughs> Olin repeated softly, not quite contemptuously. He held out the old-fashioned key in its old-fashioned brass paddle. How's your own heart, Mr. Enslin? Not to mention your blood pressure, your psychological condition. Mike found it took an actual conscious effort to lift his hand. But once he got it moving, it was fine. He rose to the key without even the minutest trembling at the fingertips, so far as he could say. All fine, Mr. Olin. All fine. He grasped the war and brass paddle. Besides, I'm wearing my lucky Hawaiian shirt. Olin insisted on accompanying Mike to the 14th floor in the elevator. Mike did not demure. He was interested to see that once they were out of the manager's office and walking down the hall which led to the elevators, the man reverted to his less consequential self. He became, once again, poor Mr. Olin, the flunky who had fallen into the rider's clutches. A man in a tux, Mike guessed he was either the restaurant manager or the maitre d', stopped them, offered Olin a thin sheaf of papers. He murmured to him in French, Olin murmured back, nodding, and quickly scribbled his signature on the sheets. The fellow in the bar was now playing Autumn in New York. From this distance, it had an echoey sound like music heard in a dream. <clears throat> the man in the tuxedo said, Merci bien, and went on his way. Mike and the hotel manager went on theirs. Olin again asked if he could carry Mike's little valise, and Mike again refused. In the elevator, Mike found his eyes drawn to a neat triple row of buttons. Everything was where it should have been. There were no gaps. And yet... If you looked more closely, you saw that there was. The button marked 12 was followed by the one marked 14. As if, Mike thought, they could make the number non-existent by omitting it from the control panel of an elevator. Foolishness. And yet, Olin was right, it was done all over the world that way. As the car rose, Mike said, I'm, uh, 
Curious about something. Why didn't you simply create a fictional resident for the room, 1408, if it scares you all the badly as you say? For that matter, Mr. Olin, why not declare it as your own residence? Well, I meh, considered it. I suppose I was afraid it would, I would be accused of fraud, if not by the people responsible for enforcing state and federal civil rights statutes. Hotel people feel about civil rights laws as many of your readers feel about clanking chains in the night. And if not by you, then by my bosses, if they got wind of it. If I couldn't persuade you to stay out of 1408, I doubt that I would have had more, much more luck in convincing the Stanley Corporation's board of directors that I, I took a perfectly good room off the market because I was afraid the spooks caused occasional traveling salesman to jump out the window and splatter himself all over 61st Street. Mike somehow found this the most disturbing thing Golden had said yet. Because he's not trying to convince me anymore, he thought. Whatever salesman powers he had in his office. Maybe it's some vibe that comes up from the Persian rug. He loses it out here. Competency, yes. You could see that when he was signing the maitre d's chits. But not salesmanship. Not personal magnetism. Not out here. But he believes it. <laughs> he believes it all. Above the door, the illuminated 12 went out and 14 came on. The elevator stopped. The door slid open to reveal a perfectly ordinary hotel corridor with a red and gold carpet, most definitely not a Persian, and electric fixtures that looked like 19th century gaslights. <clears throat> Here we are, Holden said. Your floor. You'll pardon me if I leave you here. 1408's to your left, the end of the hall, unless I absolutely have to. I don't go any, miss any closer than this, Miss Mr. Henson. Mike stepped out of the elevator on legs that seemed heavier than they should have. He turned back to Olin, a pudgy little man in a black coat and carefully knitted wine-colored tie. Olin's manicured hands were clasped behind him. Now Mike saw the little man's face was as pale as cream. On his high, lineless forehead, drops of perspiration stood out. There's a uh, telephone room in the room, of course. Um, you could try it if you find yourself in trouble. Well, then, I doubt it'll work. Not if the uh, room doesn't want it to. Mike thought of a light reply, something about how that would save him room service charges, at least. But all at once, his tongue seemed as heavy as his legs that just lay there on the floor of his mouth. Holden brought one hand out from behind his back, and Mike's always trembling. Mr. Enslin, Mike, don't do this, really. Really, don't do this. Before he could finish, the elevator door slid shut, cutting him off. Mike stood where he was for a moment. In the perfect New York hotel, sidelines of what no one on the staff would admit was the 13th floor of the Hotel Mahana, and thought of reaching out and pushing the elevator's call button. Except, uh, if he did that, Olin would win. There would be a large gaping hole where the best chapter of his new book should have been. The readers might not know that his editor and his agent might not know it. Robinson, the lawyer, might not know it. But he himself would. So instead of pushing the call button, he reached up and he touched the cigarette behind his ear, that old distracted gesture he no longer knew he was making, and flicked the collar of his lucky Hawaiian shirt. And then he started down the hallway toward 1408, swinging his overnight case by his side. Now, the most interesting artifact left in the wake of Michael Enslin's brief stay, it lasted about 70 minutes, in room 1408, was the 11 minutes of recorded tape in his mini-quarter, which was charred a bit but not even close to destroyed. The fascinating thing about the narration was how little narration there was, and how odd it became. The mini-quarter had been a present from Mike's ex-wife, with whom he had remained friendly five years before. On his first case expedition, the Brillsby Farm in Kansas, <clears throat> Mike had taken it almost as an afterthought, along with five yellow legal pads and a leather case filled with sharpened pencils. By the time he reached the door of room 1408 in the Hotel Mahana, three books later, he came with a single pen and a notebook, plus five fresh 90-minute cassettes in addition to the one he had loaded into the machine before leaving his apartment. One of the most important mm, tools of ghost hunting is a good audio recorder. He discovered the narration served him better than note-taking. He was able to catch anecdotes, some of them pretty great as they happened. The bats that had dive bobbed him in the supposedly haunted tower of Gartsby Castle, for instance. <laughs> yeah, Mike had shrieked like a little girl in her first trip through a carny haunted house. 
Friends hearing this were invariably amused. Little tape recorder was more practical than written notes, too. Especially when you're in a chilly New Brunswick graveyard and a squall of rain and wind collapsed your tent at three in the morning. You couldn't take very successful notes in such circumstances, but you could talk, which was what Mike had done, gone on talking as he struggled out of the wet, flapping canvas of his tent, never losing sight of the mini quarter's comforting red eye. Over the years, in the case expeditions, the little Sony mini quarter had become his friend. He'd never recorded a first-hand account of a true supernatural vent on the filament-thin ribbon of tape running between its reels, and that included the broken commons he'd made while in 1408. But it was probably not surprising that he had arrived at such feelings of affection for the little gadget. Long-haul truckers come to love their Kenworths and their uh, Jimmy Peets. Writers treasure a certain pen or a battered old typewriter. Professional cleaning ladies are loath to give up the old Electrolux. Mike had never had to stand up to an actual ghost or a psychokinetic event <laughs> with only his mini quarter, his version of a cross and a bunch of garlic, to protect him, but he had been there. Plenty of cold, uncomfortable nights. He was hard-headed if that didn't make him inhuman. His problems with 1408 started even before he got into the room. The door was crooked. Not by a lot. But it was crooked, all right. Canted just a tiny bit to the left. It made Mike think of the first scary movies where the director um, <clears throat> tried to indicate mental distress and one of the characters were tipping the camera on, a, on the point-of-view shots. This association was followed by another one, the, the way doors looked when you were on a boat where the weather was a little heavy. Back and forth they went, right and left they went, tick and talk they went, until you felt it started to feel a bit woozy in your head and your stomach. Not that he felt that way himself, no, not at all, but... Actually, yeah, I do. Just a little, Mike thought. And he would say so, too, if only because of Olin's insinuation that his attitude made it impossible for him to be fair in the undoubtedly subjective field of spook journalism. Mike bent over, aware that the slightly woozy feeling in his stomach left as soon as he was no longer looking at that subtly off-kilter door. He unzipped the pocket of his overnighter. He took out his mini-quarter. He pushed record as he straightened up. He saw the little red eye go on, and he opened his mouth to say, The door of room 1408 offers its own unique greeting. It appears to have been set crooked, tipped slightly to the left. But he said, The door, and that's all. If you listen to the tape, you can hear both words clearly. The door, and then the click of the stop button. Because the door was not crooked, it was perfectly straight. Mike turned, looked at the door of 1409 across the hall, then back at the door of 1408. Both doors were the same, white, with gold-numbered plaques and gold doorknobs, both perfectly straight. Mike bent, picked up his overnight case, with a hand holding the mini-quarter, moved the key in his other hand toward the lock, then stopped again. The door was crooked again. This time it was tilted slightly to the right. <clears throat> this is ridiculous, Mike murmured, but that woozy feeling had already started in his stomach again. It wasn't just like seasickness, it was seasickness. Mike had crossed to England on the QE2 a couple of years ago, and one night had been extremely rough. What Mike remembered most clearly was lying in the bed in his stateroom, always on the verge of throwing up and never quite able to do it. And how the feeling of nauseated vertigo got worse if you looked at a doorway or a table or a chair, and how they would go back and forth, right and left, tick and talk. This is Olin's fault, Mike thought. Exactly what he wants. He built you up for it, buddy. He set you up for it, man. How he'd laugh if he could see you. How... Ah, Mike's thoughts broke off. As he realized Olin very likely could see him right now. Mike looked back down the corridor toward the elevator, barely noticing that slightly woozy feeling in his stomach left the moment he stopped staring at the door. Above and to the left of the elevators, he saw that he expected a closed-circuit camera. One of the house dicks might be looking in at this very moment, and Mike was willing to bet that Olin was right there with him, both of them grinning like apes. Teach him to come in here and start throwing his weight and his lawyer around, Olin says. Yeah, look at him, the security man replies, grinning more widely than ever. White as a ghost himself. He hasn't even touched the key to the lock yet. <laughs> you got him, boss. You got him. Got him hooked, line, and sinker. Cursed if you do, Mike thought. I stayed in the Rillsby house. I slept in the room where at least two of them were killed, and I did sleep, whether you believed it or not. I spent a night right next to Jeffrey Dahmer's grave, and 
another two stones over from H.P. Lovecraft's. I brushed my teeth next to the tub where Sir David Smith supposedly drowned both of his wives. I stopped being scared of campfire stories a long time ago. He looked back at the door, and the door was straight. He grunted, pushed the key into the lock, and turned it. The door opened. Mike stepped in. The door did not swing slowly shut behind him as he felt for the light switch, leaving him in total darkness. Besides, the lights of the apartment building next door shone through the window. He found the switch. When he flicked it, the overhead light enclosed in a collection of dangling crystal ornaments came on. So did the standing lamp by the desk on the far side of the room. The window was above this desk, so someone sitting there writing could pause in his work and look out on 61st Street. <laughs> or jump out on 61st Street if the urge so took him. Except... Mike set down his bag just inside the door, closed the door, and pushed record again. The little red light went on. According to Olin, six people have jumped from the window I'm looking at. But I won't be taking any dives from the 14th, excuse me, 13th floor of the Hotel Mahana tonight. There's an iron steel mesh grill over the outside. Better safe than sorry. 1408 is what you would call a junior suite, I guess. Uh, the room I'm in has two chairs, a sofa, a writing desk, a cabinet, and Probably contains a TV, maybe a minibar. Carpet on the floor is unremarkable. Not a patch on Olin's, believe me. Wallpaper, ditto, it... Wait. At this point, the listener hears another click on the tape as Mike hits the stop button again. All the scant narration on the tape has that same fragmentary quality, which is utterly unlike the other 150 or so tapes as literary agent's possession. In addition, his voice grows steadily more distracted. It is not the voice of a man at work but of a perplexed individual who has begun talking to himself without realizing it. The elliptical nature of the tapes and that growing verbal distraction combined to give most listeners a distinct feeling of unease. Many ask that the tape be turned off long before the end is reached. Mere words on a page cannot adequately convey a listener's growing conviction that he is hearing a man lose, if not his mind, then his hold on conventional reality. But even the flat words themselves suggest that something was happening. What Mike had noticed at that point were pictures on the walls. They appeared to be stretching. No, that wasn't right. There were three of them. A lady in twenties-style evening dress standing on a staircase. A sailing ship done in the fashion of Courier and Ives, and a still life of fruit, the latter painted with an unpleasant yellow-orange cast of the apples, as well as the oranges and bananas. All three pictures were in glass frames, and all three were crooked. He'd been about to mention the crookedness on the tape, Though it was so unusual, so worthy of comment about three off-kilter pictures. That a door could be crooked, well, that had a little of the old cabin of Dr. Caligari charm, didn't it? But the door had not been crooked. His eyes had tricked him for a moment, that was all. The lady on the stairs tilted to the left. So did the sailing ship, which showed well-bottomed British tars lining the rail to watch a school of flying fish. The yellowish-orange fruit... To Mike, it looked like a bowl of painted fruit by the light of a suffocating equatorial sun, a Paul Bowles desert sun, <laughs> tilted to the right. Although he was not ordinarily a fussy man, he circled the room, setting them straight. Looking at them crooked like that was making him feel a touch nauseated again. He wasn't entirely surprised either. One grew susceptible to the feeling. He had discovered that on the QE2, he'd been told that if one persevered through the period of increased susceptibility, one usually adapted. Got your sea legs, some of the old hands still said. Mike had not done enough sailing to get his sea legs, nor cared to. These days he stuck with his land legs. And straightening the three pictures in the unremarkable sitting room of 1408 would settle his midsection. No good for him. Mike glanced at the clock on the wall. 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Well, that's the time of the story is usually over. Only this story is not over because, as we mentioned at the beginning, it's going to run somewhat lengthy perhaps 20 minutes over. And so we're going to continue on. <clears throat> and he looked back at the pictures again. There was dust on the glass covering the pictures. He chilled his fingers across the still life and left two parallel streaks. The dust had a greasy, slippery feeling. Like silk just before it rots was what came into Mike's mind, but no way was he going to put that on the tape either. How was he supposed to know what filth, silk felt like just before it rotted? was a drunkard's thought. When the pictures were set to rise, he stepped back and surveyed them. 
The evening dress lady by the door leading into the bedroom, the ship plying one of the seven seas to the left of the writing desk, and finally the nasty and quite badly painted fruit by the TV cabinet. <clears throat> Part of Mike expected they would be crooked again, or fall crooked as he looked at them. That was the way things happened in movies like House on a Haunted Hill or in old episodes of The Twilight Zone. <laughs> but the pictures remained perfectly straight as he had fixed them. Not, he told himself, that he would have found anything supernatural or paranormal in a return to their former crooked state. In his experience, reversion was the nature of things. People had given up smoking. Here he touched a cigarette caught behind his ear without being aware of it. Wanted to go on smoking. Pictures have been hanging crooked since Nixon was president. Wanted to go on hanging crooked. And they've been here a long time, no doubt about that, Mike thought. If I lifted them away from the walls, I'd see lighter patches on the wallpaper or bugs squirming out the way they do when you turn over a rock. There's something both shocking and nasty about this idea. It came with a vivid image of blind white bugs oozing out of the pale and formerly protector wallpaper like living pus. Mike raised the mini quarter, pushed record, and said, Olin has certainly started a train of thought in my head, or a chain of thought, which is it? He set out to give me the heebie-jeebies, and he certainly succeeded. On the tape at this point, flat and perfectly articulated, Mike Enslin says, I've got to get a hold of myself right now. This is followed by another click as he shuts the tape off again. Mike closed his eyes and took four long measured breaths, one holding each one to a five count before letting it out again. Nothing like this had ever happened to him. Not in the supposedly haunted houses, the supposedly haunted graveyards, or the supposedly haunted castles. This wasn't like being haunted, or what he imagined being haunted would be like. This was like being stoned on bad, cheap dope. Olin did this to me. Olin hypnotized me. I'm going to break out of it. I'm going to spend the night in this ruin, not just because it's the best location I've ever been, and leave out Olin and got almost enough for a ghost story of the decade already. But Olin does not get to win. Him and his stupid story about 30 people having died in here, they don't get to win. I'm the one in charge of things around here, so just breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. In, out. He went on like that for nearly 90 seconds, and then he opened his eyes again. He felt normal. The pictures on the wall, still straight. Fruit in the bowl. Still yellow-orange and uglier than ever. Eat one piece of that fruit and you'd cramp for a week. He pushed record. The eye went on. Had a little vertigo there for a minute uh, or two. He crossed the room to the writing desk and the window with his protective mesh outside. It might have been a hangover from Olin's yarn yarning, but I could believe I, I could believe I feel a genuine presence in here. He felt no such thing, of course, but once that was on the tape, he could write almost anything he pleased. The air is stale, no musty fouling, oh, foul smells. Um, Olin said the place gets aired every time it gets turned, but the turns are quick and, yeah, it's stale. Hey, look at this. It was an ashtray on the writing desk, one of those little ones made of thick glass you used to see in hotels everywhere, and it was a book of matches. On the front was the Hotel Mahana. In front of the hotel stood a smiling doorman in a very old-fashioned uniform, the kind with shoulder boards, gold frogging, and a cap that looked as if it belonged in a gay bar perched on the head of a motorcycle ramrod wearing nothing else but a few silver body rings. Going back and forth on Fifth Avenue in front of the hotel were cars from that era. Packards, Hudson, Studebakers, and, and Finney Kreisch, the New Yorkers. The matchbook in the ashtray looks like it comes from about 1955. Mike said and slipped it into the pocket of his lucky Hawaiian shirt. I'm keeping it as a souvenir. Now it's time for a little fresh air. There's a clunk as he sets the mini quarter down, presumably on the writing desk. There's a pause followed by vague sounds and a couple of effortful grunts. After these come a second pause and a squeaking sound. Success, he says. This is a little off mic, but the follow-up is closer. Success, Mike repeated, picking the mini quarter up off the desk. The bottom half of the window wouldn't budge. It's like it's nailed shut, but the top half came down all right. I can hear the traffic on Fifth Avenue and all the beeping horns have a comforting quality. Someone's playing a saxophone, perhaps in front of the plaza, which is across the street two blocks down. It reminds me of my brother. Mike stopped abruptly, looking at the little red eye. It seemed to accuse him. His brother? 
His brother was dead, another fallen soldier in the tobacco wars. Then he relaxed. What of it? These were the spook wars, where Michael Enslin had always come off the winner. As for Donald Enslin, he said into the mic, My brother was actually eaten by wolves one winter on the Connecticut Turnpike. Ha 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 ha. And then he pushed stop. There's more on the tape, a little more. But that's the final statement of any coherence. The final statement, that is, to which a clear meaning can be ascribed. Mike turned on his heels and looked at the pictures. Still hanging perfectly straight, good little pictures that they were. That's still life, though. What an ugly, stinking thing that was. He pushed record and spoke two words. Fuming oranges into the mini quarter. Then he turned it off again and walked across the room to the door leading into the bedroom. He paused with the evening-dressed lady and reached into the darkness, feeling for the light switch. He had just one moment to register. It feels like old dead skin. Something wrong with the wallpaper under his sliding palm, and then he, his fingers found the switch. The bedroom was flooded with yellow light, and from one of the ceiling textures fixtures buried in hanging glass baubles, the bed was a double hiding under a yellow-orange coverlet. <laughs> Why say hiding? Mike asked his meaning quarter and pushed stop button again. He stepped in, fascinated by the fuming desert of the coverlet, by the tumorous bulges of the pillows beneath it. Sleep here? Not at all, sir. We like sleeping inside that stupid still life, sleeping in that horrible hot Paul Bowl room you couldn't quite see, a room for lunatic expatriate English when you just naturally associated with unnatural acts. Mike pushed record. The red eye came on and he said, Orpheus on the Orpheum circuit, into the mic, and then he pushed stop again. He approached the bed. The cover lit gleam yellow-orange. The wallpaper, perhaps cream-colored by daylight, had picked up the yellow-orange glow of the coverlet. There was a little night table to either side of the bed. On one was a telephone, black and large, and equipped with a dial. The finger holes in the dial looked like surprised white eyes. On the other table was a dish with a plum on it. Mike pushed record and said, That isn't a real plum. That's a plastic plum. He pushed stop again. On the bed itself was a doorknob menu. Mike saddled up one side of the bed, being quite careful to touch neither bed nor wall, and picked the menu up. He tried not to touch the cover on the bed either, but the tips of his fingers brushed it, and he moaned. It was soft in some terrible, wrong way. Nevertheless, he picked the menu up. It was in French, and although it had been years since he had taken the language, one of the breakfast items appeared to be birds boiled in tripe. At least sounds like something the French might eat, he thought, and let out a wild, distracted laugh. He closed his eyes and opened them. The menu was in Russian. He closed his eyes and opened them again. The menu was in Italian. He closed his eyes and opened them. There was no menu. It was a picture of a screaming little woodcut boy looking back over his shoulder at the woodcut wolf which had swallowed his left leg up to the knee. The wolf's ears were laid back and he looked like a terrier with his favorite toy. I don't see that, Mike thought. And of course he didn't. Without closing his eyes, he saw neat lines of English, each line listing a different breakfast temptation. Eggs, waffles, fresh berries, no birds boiled in tripe. Still, he turned around very slowly, edged himself out of the little space between the wall and the bed, a space that now felt as narrow as a grave. His heart was beating so hard he could feel it in his neck and his wrists as well as his chest. His eyes were throbbing in their sockets. 1408 was wrong. Yes, indeed, 1408 was very wrong. Olin had said something about poison gas, and that was what Mike felt like. Someone who'd been gassed or forced to smoke strong hashish laced with insect poison. Olin had done this to him, of course, probably with the active laughing connivance of the security people, pumped his special poison gas up through the vents. Just because Mike could see no vents didn't mean the vents weren't there. Mike looked around the bedroom with wide, frightened eyes. There was no plum on the end table to the left of the bed, no plate either. The table was bare. He turned. He started for the door leading back to the sitting room and stopped. There was a picture on the wall. He couldn't be absolutely sure. In his present state, he couldn't be absolutely sure of his own name. But he was fairly sure that there had been no picture there when he first came in. It was a still life. A single plum sat on a tin plate in the middle of an old plank table. The light falling across the plum in the plate was feverish yellow-orange. Tango light, he thought, the kind of light that makes the dead get up out of their graves and tango. The kind of light... I've got to get out of here, he whispered. 
and blundered back into the sitting room. He became aware that his ghost said his shoes had begun to make odd smooching sounds, as if the floor beneath them were growing soft. The pictures on the living room wall were crooked again. And there were other changes as well. The lady on the stairs had pulled down the top of her gown, burying her breasts. She held one in each hand, a drop of blood hung from each. She was staring directly into Mike's eye and grinning ferociously. Her teeth were filed to cannibal points. At the rail of the sailing ship, the tars had been replaced by a line of pallid men and women. The man on the far left near the ship's bow wore a brown wool suit and held a derby hat in one hand. His hair was slick to his brow and parted in the middle. His face was shocked and vacant. Mike knew the name of that man, Kevin O'Malley, this room's first occupant, a sewing machine salesman who had jumped from this room in October of 1910. To O'Malley's left, there were others who had died here, all with that same vacant, shocked expression. It made them look related, all members of the same inbred and cataclysmically retarded family. In the picture where the fruit had been, there was now a severed human head. Yellow-orange light swam off the sunken cheeks, the sagging chip lips, the upturned glazing eyes, the cigarette parked behind the right ear. Mike blundered toward the door, his feet smooching and now actually seeming to stick a little at each step. The door would not open, of course. The chain hung unengaged, and thumbbolts stood straight up by clock hands pointing to six o'clock. But the door would not open. Breathing rapidly, Mike turned from it and waited, that was what it felt like, across the room to the writing desk. He could see the curtains beside the window he had cracked open, waving desultorily, but he could feel no fresh air against his face. It was as though the room were swallowing it. He could still hear horns on fifth, but they were now very distant. Did he still hear the saxophone? If so, the room had stolen its sweetness and melody and left only an atonal reedy drone like the wind blowing across a hole in a dead man's neck or a pop bottle filled with severed fingers or... Stop it! He tried to say. But Mike could no longer speak. His heart was hammering at a terrible pace. It went much faster would explode. His mini-quarter, faithful companion of many case expeditions, was no longer in his hand. He had left it somewhere, in the bedroom. If it was in the bedroom, it was probably gone by now, swallowed by the room. When it was digested, it would be excreted into one of the pictures. Gasping for breath like a runner nearing the end of a long race, Mike put a hand to his chest as if to soothe his heart. When he felt his left breast pocket, his gaudy shirt was a small square shape of the mini-quarter. The feel of it, so solid and known, steadied Mike a little brought him back a little. He became aware that he was humming, that the room seemed to be humming back at him as if myriad mouths were concealed beneath the smoothly nasty wallpaper. He was aware that his stomach was now so nauseated that it seemed to be swinging in its own greasy hammock. He could feel the air crowding against his ears in a soft coagulating clots, and it made him think of how fudge was when it reached the softball stage. But he was back a little, Enough to be positive of one thing. He had to call for help while there was still time. Mommy. The thought of Olin smirking in his deferential New York hotel manager way and saying, I told you so, Mr. Ensland, did not bother Mike now. And the idea that Olin had somehow induced these strange perceptions and horrible fear by chemical means had entirely left Mike's mind. It was the room. It was the damned room. He meant to jab out a hand to the old old-fashioned telephone, the twin of the one in the bedroom, and snatch it up. Instead, Mike watched his arm descend to the table in a kind of delirious slow motion, so like the arm of a diver he almost expected to see bubbles rising from it. He closed his fingers around the handset and picked it up. His other hand dove as deliberate as the first and dialed zero. As he put the handset of the phone against his ear, he heard a series of clicks as the dial spun back to its original position. It sounded like the wheel, a wheel of fortune. Do you want to spin, or do you want to solve the puzzle? Remember that if you try to solve the puzzle and fail, you would put out into the snow beside the Connecticut turnpike, and the wolves will eat you. There was no ring in his ear. Instead, a harsh voice simply began speaking. This is nine, nine, this is nine, nine, this is ten, ten. We have killed your friends. Every friend is now dead. This is five, five. 
Mike listened with growing horror. Not at what the voice was saying, but at its raspy emptiness. It was not a machine-generated voice. It wasn't a human voice, either. It was the voice of the room, the presence pouring out of the walls and the floor, the presence speaking to him from the telephone had nothing in common with any haunting or paranormal event he had ever read about. There was something alien here. No, not here yet, but it's coming. It's hungry, and your dinner... The phone fell from his relaxing fingers. He turned around and swung at the end of its cord the way his stomach was swinging back and forth inside of him. He could still hear that rasping voice out of the black. Eighteen, eighteen, take cover when the sirens sound. This is four, four, four. He was not aware of taking the cigarette from behind his ear and putting it in his mouth or fumbling the book of matches with the old-fashioned gold frog dormant on it out of his right shirt, right breast pocket. Not aware that after nine years he had finally decided to have a smoke. Before him, the room had begun to melt. It was sagging out of its right angles, in straight lines. Not into the curves, but into strange Moorish arcs that hurt his eyes. The glass chandelier in the center of the feeling began, ceiling began to sag like a, a thick glob of spit. The pictures began to bend, turning into shapes like the windshields of old cars. From behind the glass of the picture by the door and leading into the bedroom, the twenties woman with the bleeding breasts and the grinning cannibal teeth whirled around and ran back up the stairs, going with jerky, delirious high knee positions, histening of a vamp in a silent movie. The telephone continued to grind and spit, the voice coming from it now as the voice of an electric hair clipper that learned how to talk. Five, five, ignore the siren. Even if you leave this room, you can never leave this room. Eight, this is eight, eight. The door to the Bedroom and the door to the hall had begun to collapse downward, widening in the middle and becoming doorways for beings possessed of unhallowed shapes. The light began to grow bright and hot, filling the room with that yellow-orange glow. Now he could see rips in the wallpaper, black pores that quickly grew to become mouths. The floor sank into a concave arc, and now he could hear it coming, the dweller in the room, behind the room, the thing in the walls, the owner of the buzzing voice. Four! Four! The phone screamed. Four! This is four! This is four! He looked down at the matchbook in his hand, the one he had plucked out of the bedroom ashtray. Funny old doorman, funny old cars, the big chrome gills, grills, and words running across the bottom that he hadn't seen in a long time, because now the strip of abrasive stuff was always on the back. Close cover before striking. Without thinking about it, he no longer could think. Mike Enslin tore out a single match, allowing the cigarette to drop out of his mouth at the same time. He struck the match, immediately touched it to the others in the book. There was a <laughs> a strong whiff of burning sulfur that went into his head like a whiff of smelling salts and a bright flare of match ends. And again, without so much as a single thought, Mike held the flaring bouquet of fire against the front of his shirt. It was a cheap thing made in Korea or Cambodia or Borneo. Old now. It caught fire at once. Before the flames could blaze up in front of his eyes, rending the room once more unstable, Mike saw it clearly, like a man who was awakened from a nightmare only to find the nightmare all around him. His head was clear. The strong whiff of sulfur and the sudden rising heat from his shirt had done that much, but the room maintained its insanely Moorish accent. Moorish was wrong, not even very close, but it was the only word that seemed to reach toward what had happened here, what was still happening. He was in a melting, rotting cave full of swoops and mad tilts. The door to the bedroom had become the door to some sarcophagal inner chamber, and to his left where the picture of the fruit had been, the wall was bulging outward toward him, splitting open in those long, cracked, and gape-like mouths, opening on a world from which something, and something, was now approaching him. Mike Gensland could hear its slobbering, avid breath and smell something alive and dangerous. It smelled a little like the lion house, and, the, and then the flame scorched the undershelf of his chin, banishing thought. The heat rising from his blazing shirt put that waver back into the world, and as he began to smell the crispy aroma of his own chest hair starting to fry, Mike again bolted across the sagging rug to the hall door. An insectile buzzing sound had begun to sweat out of the walls. The yellow-orange light was steadily brightening, as if a hand were turning up an invisible rheostat. But this time, when he reached the door and turned the knob, the door opened. It was as if the thing behind the bulging wall had no use for a burning man, did not perhaps relish cooked meat. A popular song from the 50s suggests that love makes the world go round, but coincidence would probably be a better bet. 
Rufus Dearborn, who was staying that night in room 1414, up near the elevators, was a salesman for the Singer Sewing Machine Company in town from Texas to talk about moving up to an executive position. And so it happened that 90 or so years after the room 1408's first occupant jumped to his death, another sewing machine salesman saved the life of the man who had come to write about the purportedly haunted room. Well, perhaps that's an exaggeration. Mike Enslin might have lived even if no one, especially a fellow on his way back from a visit to the ice machine, had been in the hallway at that moment. Having your shirt catch fire is no joke, though, and he certainly would have been burned much more severely and extensively if not for Dearborn, who thought fast and moved even faster. Not that Dearborn ever remembered exactly what happened. He constructed a coherent enough story for the newspapers and TV cameras. He liked the idea of being a hero very much, and it certainly did no harm to his executive aspirations. And he clearly remembered seeing the man on fire lunge out into the hall. And after that, everything was a blur. Thinking about it was like trying to reconstruct the things you had done during the vilest, deepest drunk of your life. One thing he was sure of didn't tell any of the reporters, because it made no sense. The burning man's scream seemed to grow in volume, as if he were a stereo that was being turned up. He was right there in front of Dearborn, but the pitch of the scream never changed, but the volume almost certainly did. It was as if the man were some incredibly loud object that was just arriving there. Dearborn ran down the hall with the fullest ice bucket in his hand. The burning man, it was just his shirt on fire, I saw that right away, he told the reporters. Struck the door opposite the room he had come out of, rebounded, staggered, fell to his knees. That was when Dearborn reached him. He put his foot on the burning shoulder of the screaming man's shirt and pushed him over onto the hall carpet. Then he dumped the contents of the ice bucket onto him. These things were all blurred in his memory, but accessible. He was aware that the burning shirt seemed to be casting far too much light. A sweltering yellow-orange light that made him think of a trip he and his brother had made to Australia two years before. They had rented an all-wheel drive and had taken off across the great Australian desert. A few natives called it the great Australian bugger hole. The Dearborn brothers discovered. A hell of a trip. Great, but spooky. Especially the big rock in the middle, Ayers Rock, Uluru. They had reached it right around sunset, and the night on its many faces was like this. Hot, strange, not really what you thought of as earth light at all. The Dearborn dropped beside the burning man, who was now only smoldering man, the covered with ice cubes man, and rolled him over to stifle the flames reaching around to the back of his shirt. When he did, he saw the skin on the left side of the man's neck had gone a smoky, bubbly red, and the lobe of his ear on that side had melted a little. But otherwise, otherwise, Dearborn looked up, and it seemed, and this was crazy bit, but it seemed the door to the room the man had come out of was filled with the burning light of an Australian sundown, the hot light of an empty place where things no man has ever seen might live. It was terrible, that light, and the low buzzing like an electric clipper that was trying desperately to speak. But it was fascinating, too. Dorborn wanted to go into that room. He wanted to see what was behind it. Perhaps Mike saved Dearborn's life then, too. He was certainly aware that Dearborn was getting up, as if Mike no longer held the interest for him, and that his face was filled with the blazing, pulsing light coming out of room 1408. He remembered that this better than Dearborn later did himself, but, of course, Roof Dearborn had not been reduced to setting himself on fire in order to survive. Mike grabbed the cuff of Dearborn's slacks. Don't go in there, man, he said in a cracked, smoky voice. You'll never come out. Dearborn stopped looking now at the reddening, blistering face of the man on the carpet. It's haunted, Mike said, as if the words had been a talisman. The door of 1408 slammed furiously shut on its own, cutting off the light, cutting off the terrible buzz that was almost words. Rufus Dearborn, one of the singer's sewing machine's finest, ran down to the elevators and pulled the fire alarm. Now, there's an interesting picture of Mike Enslin and treating the burn victim of a diagnostic approach, the 16th edition of which appeared uh, about 16 months after Mike's short stay in room 1408 of the Hotel Mahana. The photo shows just his torso, but it's Mike's, all right. One can tell by the white square on the left side of his chest. The flesh all around it's an angry red, actually blistered into second-degree burns in some places. 
A white square marks the left breast pocket of the shirt he was wearing that night, the lucky shirt with the mini quarter in its pocket. The mini quarter itself melted around the corners, but it still works. The tape inside is fine. It's the things on that tape which are not fine. After listening two or three or four times, Mike's agent, Sam Farrell, tossed it into his wall safe, refusing to acknowledge the goose flesh all around his tan, scrawny arms. And that wall safe, the tape has stayed ever since. Farrell has no urge to take it out and play it again, not for himself, not for his curious friends, some of whom would cheerfully kill to hear it. New York publishing is a small community, and word gets around. He doesn't like Mike's voice on the tape. He doesn't like the stuff that voice is saying. My brother was actually eaten by wolves one winter in the Connecticut Turnpike. What is that supposed to mean? And most of all, he doesn't like the background sounds on the tape. A kind of liquid smooshing that sometimes sounds like clothes churning around an oversudden washer. Something like one of those old electric hair clippers. and Sometimes, weirdly, like a voice. While Mike was still in the hospital, a man named Olin, manager of the hotel, if you please, came and asked Sam Farrell if he could listen to that tape. Farrell said no, he could not. What Olin could do was take himself out on the agent's office at a rapid hike and be thankful all the way back to the flea bag where he worked that Mike Enslin had decided not to sue either the hotel or Olin for negligence. I tried to persuade him not to go in, Olin said quietly. A man who spent most of his nights working days listening to tired travelers. Petulant guests bitch about everything from their rooms, the magazine selection, and the news stand. He wasn't much perturbed by Farrell's rancor. I tried everything in my power. If anyone was negligent that night, Mr. Farrell, it was your client. He believed too much in nothing. Very unwise behavior, very unsafe behavior. I would guess he has changed the one in that regard. In spite of Farrell's distaste for the tape, he would like Mike to listen to it, acknowledge it, perhaps use it as a pad from which to launch a new book. There's a book in What Happened to Mike Farrell. To Mike, Farrell knows it. Not just a chapter, a 40-page case history, but an entire book, one that might outsell all three of the ten nights combined. Of course, he doesn't believe Mike's assertion that he is finished not only with ghost tales, but with all writing. Writers say that from time to time. That's all. The occasional prima donna outburst is part of what makes writers in the first place. As for Mike Enslin himself, he got lucky, all things considered, and he knows it. He could have been burned much more badly than he actually was. If not for Mr. Dearborn and his bucket of ice, he might have had 20 or even 30 different skin graft procedures to suffer through instead of only four. His neck is scarred on the left side in spite of the grafts, but the doctors at the Boston Burn Institute tell him the scars will fade on their own, eventually. He also knows that burns, painful as they were in the weeks and months after that night, were necessary. If not for the matches with the closed cover before striking written on the front, he would have died in 1408. And his end would have been unspeakable. To a coroner, it might have been looked like a stroke or a heart attack, but the actual cause of death would have been much nastier. Much nastier. Mike was also lucky in having produced three popular books on ghosts and hauntings before actually running afoul of a place that is haunted. This he also knows. Sam Farrell may not believe Mike's life as a writer is over, but Sam doesn't need to. Mike knows that for both of them. He cannot so much as write a postcard without feeling cold all over his skin and being nauseated deep in the pit of his belly. Sometimes just looking at a pen or a tape recorder will make him think, The pictures are crooked. I tried to straighten the pictures. He doesn't know what that means, though, when he does think it. He can't remember the pictures. He can't remember anything from room 1408. And he's glad of that. That, in fact, is a mercy. His blood pressure isn't so good these days. His doctor told him that burn victims often develop problems with their blood pressure and put them on medication. His eyes trouble him. His ophthalmologist told him to start taking Occupites. He has consistent back problems. His prostate's gotten too large. But he can deal with these things. He knows he isn't the first person to escape 1408 without really escaping. Olin tried to tell him, but it isn't all that bad. At least he doesn't remember. Sometimes he has nightmares, quite often, in fact, almost every night, in fact. But he barely remembers them when he wakes up. A sense that things are rounding off at the corners, mostly. Melting the way the corners of his mini-quarter melted. 
He lives on Long Island these days, and when the weather is good, he takes long walks on the beach. The closest he's ever come to articulating what he does remember about his 70-odd, very odd minutes in 1408 was on one of those walks. It was never human, he told the incoming waves in a choked, halting voice. Ghosts, at least ghosts, were once human. The thing in the walls, though, that thing. Time may improve it. Mike Cannon does hope for that. Time may fade it as it will fade the scars on his neck. In the meantime, though, Mike sleeps with the lights on in his bedroom, so he will know at once where he is when he wakes up from the bad dreams. He's had all the phones taken out of the house. At some point just below the place where his conscious mind seems able to go, he's afraid of picking up the phone and hearing an inhuman voice. This is nine, nine. We have killed all your friends. Every friend is now dead. This is nine, nine, nine. When the sun goes down on clear evenings, Mike pulls every shade and blind and drape in the house. He sits like a man in a dark room until his watch tells him the light, even the last fading glow along the horizon, must be gone. He can't stand the light that comes at sunset. That yellow, deepening to orange, like light in the Australian desert.